Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for tonight's online talk, which has kindly been organised by the Leicestershire and Rutland Badger Group. I'm joined by our hosts this evening, David and Pam, who I'll introduce just in a little moment. Our speaker this evening is Dr Helen O'Brien, who is the mammal recorder for Leicestershire and Rutland. And the topic for the talk this evening is all about riparian animals, mammals. If we have time at the end of the talk, we will be hosting a short Q&A. So I do ask if you can please leave your questions in the Q&A box and your comments in the chat box, and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust are delighted to continue to host these talks for free. Um, however, we do ask if you would like to show your support or learn more about the Trust, you can do so by visiting our website, liwt.org.uk. Now that's all from me this evening. I'll now hand you over to David. Hello, good evening. Thank you, Jordan. Um, welcome to the Badger Group's uh, latest Zoom meeting. Um, I think most of you do know me. I'm David Duckett. I'm chairman of Leicestershire and Rutland Badger Group. Um, I put the usual plug in for the Badger Group because we are affiliated uh, to the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. And as such, we have our own membership for the Badger Group. So if anybody wishes to join us, we will very much welcome you. Uh, and that can be found, the details, on badgergroup.org.uk. And Jordan, I think, has put that out on the chat line, or will do. So we welcome any new members. Um, before we go on to our speak, uh, to meet our speaker tonight, uh, I just want to raise a few issues on badgers, which uh, the Badger Trust are pushing very hard. They've got several serious uh, campaigns to try and protect badgers. And the first one is uh, give badgers a break, B-R-A-K-E, and that is a, a campaign to try and look at reducing the level of fatality from road traffic kill. And uh, I'm sure many of you recently have seen badgers dead on the road. This is the time of year that many do get killed and there are ways of trying to do that and they want the public to support those. So if you, I'll come to uh, how you can find out more information in a, in a minute. The second is the Protection of Badgers Act was in, produced in 1992, the current one. That's 30 years on, we are at now. Um, and it's very weak in many ways. And the real weakness is the sentencing of criminals who beat badgers up, kill them and I was at a meeting at the weekend seeing the gruesome things that they do with their dogs and the dogs get very much harmed. Currently under the Badgers Act the maximum criminal sentencing for, for culprits is six months uh, in prison and it's well out of uh, many other wildlife laws where it can be up to five years so we're trying to look at or the Badger Trust to uh, get that to five years rather than six months. And the last of them is uh, there's a debate going on in Parliament uh, next Monday, the 14th, and the Badger Trust and me uh, would encourage people to try and write to their MP, MP, send them an email in the short term, in the next few days, to get them to support, support a motion to end poorly monitored and inhumane badger culling uh, with, with, with shooting. Uh, it's really badly managed, really. Uh, you have some gung-ho gunmen going around shooting badgers. Many of them don't get killed uh, straight away. They die in agony, and uh, it really goes unmonitored. If culling is going to continue, and there's already been 2,000, sorry, 200,000 badgers killed so far, uh, we want them to at least be killed humanely. Okay, um, full de details of all of these uh, campaigns are on the Badger Trust website, at badgertrust.org.uk, and Jordan will put that on the chat line. I think she already has. Uh, okay, enough of me saying about badgers. We're now going on to the main meeting tonight, and that's to uh, introduce, um, for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Elaine O'Brien. I'm sure most of you who are attending tonight, and I believe we've got uh, about 70 people, which is excellent, um, will know Helen. Uh, Helen's been act active in Leicestershire and Leicester in particular for many, many years. Uh, many of you will know she's mammal recorder for the Leicestershire and Rutland uh, Mammal Group. 
and she's also a senior conservation officer at the City Council in Leicester. So over to Helen, who's going to tell us about riparian mammals in Leicestershire and Rutland. Thank you. Helen, are you around? Hello everyone, sorry about that, a slight technical hitch. I'll just uh, bring up the presentation now, so just do that. Sorry about this, I'm just having difficulty loading up the presentation, so. Can people see that on the screen? Is that coming up? No, we're looking to see you at the moment. Okay, um, sorry about yeah. that. Let me just... No worries. Um, if ah. you just, you've got the share screen icon? Here we go. <laughs> it's all on. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> okay, let's go. Right, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, sorry about the technical hitch, so I'll make up for things uh, very quickly. Um, yeah, I have been the County Mammal Recorder for a good number of years and one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the riparian mammals that we've got within the Leicester and Rutland area. Uh, so I'd like to share some of that information with you tonight and, and hopefully that will uh, gather uh, your interest in these particular animals. Um, so the animals that I'm going to talk tonight about in particular are the otter, the water vole and the water shrew. Um, I'm also going to be referring to the American mink, which is the introduced species um, that has um, rewilded into our countryside and had an impact on some of our mammals and in particular the uh, water vole which uh, some of you may be aware of. I'm not going to be discussing uh, that particular species in great detail but I'm more interested in how it's interacting with say the water vole and the otter so uh, I'll be referring to it in that way. So what I will be talking about tonight is uh, the, the type of habitats that we would associate our riparian or our riverside mammals with, uh, the types of food and their feeding ecology, how they've actually adapted to um, living alongside the water and being within the water, what their breeding um, and population densities are, uh, both at a global, national and a local uh, level in terms of their distribution. And um, to go through some of the, the threats that actually uh, might affect their future, uh, some of which, um, you know, some of those species are living on the edge. So it's, it's important that we recognise what those threats are and then what some of those solutions might be to those threats. Um, so... Okay, so the types of habitat that uh, we're looking for that will be particularly good for our riparian species are basically clean, good water quality. And that could be in the form of rivers, lakes and canals, and also ponds and drainage ditches and reed beds and fens. So we've got a typical example on the right hand side. The, the photograph is actually of an area where um, water bowls have been um, uh, recorded for, for a good number of years and we've got a narrow water course with fairly good water quality, very lush vegetation and it's, it is an ideal habitat. Um, water shrews are also found in watercress beds and that's the natural watercress beds, they're, they're not the man-made ones that are sort of concrete bases that where uh, watercress is, is, uh, is, is really produced on a commercial basis. And the thing about water shrews is that they're also found in terrestrial habitats as well, such as rough grassland and scrub and, and hedgerows and the like. Um, so they're actually quite diverse species. Um, but the importance is having that lush vegetation so that the water voles in particular have a food source there. 
and it's also a very useful habitat for uh, predators, uh, to, sorry, to hide from predators. Um, and the otters will also use it to, to lay up and to, to stay safe. So here we have a typical um, part of the river, the River Saw, uh, that flows through from the south to the, the north of the county, uh, and then eventually into the River Trent. Um, Within the Midlands, we, or within, within the, the Leicestershire area, I should say, the saw is the main catchment and our rivers and our brooks tend to be sort of fairly small in comparison to say the Trent or the Severn. Um, so the maximum width really of the saw at any one point is only about 20 to 25 metres wide. And um, as you can see from uh, what's on the screen here, it's got the indication of what would make it a very good um, type of habitat for those species that we're talking about tonight. So the other thing that um, uh, these riparian mammals need are places to lie up and to breed and to, to feel safe and to rear their young. And in particular, otters require a larger an uh, area in which to do that. Uh, not surprisingly, because it's the, the largest mammal that we've got of our riparian species. And the, um, the mature tree uh, roots on the left-hand side are typical of, say, the crack willow, uh, the large oaks, and the, uh, the, the various other trees that line some of our watercourses. The most uh, important thing is that they have exposed roots where otters can actually go in and they can easily get access to the chambers within those roots and actually create a natural hold. They also use um, things like disused badger sets where the hole has already been made for them. Similarly, they might re-excavate out, say, a foxhole, um, and they, they might use old log piles where there's uh, cavities within them. Uh, very rarely do they actually start to excavate a halt right from the start. So this is, if you see a mature tree like that, um, it's a good idea to sort of think, well, is, is it actually going to be used by um, the, uh, the, the, the species themselves? So what I'm going to do now is just try and play a video for you, just showing uh, a couple of otters coming in and out of one of these typical holes. And what you should be able to see is that they are um, able to move quite freely in and out to disappear right within those cavities. And this particular holt is very close to the watercourse. So you can see those the, the wet um, of their fur as they as they get in and out um, and actually the physiology and the size of those animals is actually quite um, important to see as well. Um, obviously we've got a fox there right at this at the end and it's I think it's important to realize that these these holes aren't just frequented by otters or they don't um, they don't necessarily share those holes at the same time, um, but those holes, if, if they stay dry, could be frequented by uh, badgers or they could be frequented by foxes as well. But certainly these, these mammals will investigate them. So irrespective of the otters being in and sort of tucked in, into those holes, then you do find that the large mammals will actually, uh, you know, come along and investigate them, as will smaller mammals, as will uh, water side birds as well. So they're actually quite busy uh, places along that, um, that watercourse highway. So as well as having flowing water, then some of the habitats that our riparian mammals do frequent are the, um, the still waters, such as uh, the lake in front of us. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these sort of, sort of the points there, because obviously, you know, people can see for themselves. Um, but ideally, this is habitats that are frequented by the water bowl and the water shrew in particular, because they're able to burrow into the plants and they're able to eat the vegetation. There's likely to be aquatic invertebrates and terrestrial invertebrates there. So the water courses, uh, sorry, the, the water environment is there for those species 
but not necessarily altogether for the otter. So the otter is likely to use these more as a food source um, where they, they, they might you know, take the, uh, the opportunity for easily available food, high protein food, and then move on to a different area. Um, and in the, in the county of Leicestershire and Rutland, we obviously have quite a few of these types of, of lakes that they would frequent. So the feeding habits of the otter are um, quite unique to that particular species. It's a carnivore, it eats mainly fish, and it has to consume up to 15% of its body weight uh, in fish daily to actually get that amount of protein. Um, and if you've seen um, an otter uh, for real, or you've seen one, um, you know, whether it's been dead on the road or alive and, and actually uh, swimming down the, the watercourses, you will know just how big these animals can get. And obviously to, to maintain their, uh, their, uh, their health, then they need a high amount of food. Um, we've got a, a picture of the, the otter uh, feeding on fish. American signal crayfish, when it's in season they, and available, they will uh, readily eat on, um, on those. And the freshwater mussels are also something that they do like to eat. Um, so often you will find indicators of where they have been feeding. And what they tend to do is drag their food out of the water, uh, sorry, their prey out of the water and then eat it on the side rather than actually risk actually losing their prey again within the water and then having to expend more energy. So uh, if you do walk along by the side of the water course and you see the, the remains of these types of species, then it's a good indicator that they might be around. With the water vole, um, obviously a much smaller species, but it is a herbivore, so it only eats vegetation. But it does eat uh, parts of vegetation as well, which might be the berries uh, within those plant species. Um, various research has, sh has shown that a total of 237 species of vegetation have been recorded in their diet. But actually, it's mainly grasses and sedges and rushes and reeds and the like that are associated with um, a watercourse and a riparian habitat. Um, sometimes we think of rank vegetation as not being very good habitat, but actually the nettles and the rose bay willow herbs are equally as good a part of the diet for the water bowl as are those rushes and sedges. So it's important not to just dismiss those ideas, uh, sorry, those areas. Um, the important thing is, is that they will take up uh, extra vitamins and extra um, water from the berries. So when they are in, in fruit, they will readily eat those. And often when you see a photograph of the water bowl, it might be one that's, that's actually holding a, a blackberry or a, um, a, a few elderberries. Um, so, you know, don't expect them only to eat that, that green matter. As they are herbivores, um, then they have to eat a lot, they have to consume up to 80% of their body weight daily. And often when you see them, they will be munching through stuff. So it is, um, you know, the, the usual sign as with every other herbivore, uh, it's almost like a, a constant grazing and eating machine. With water shrews, um, they are very adaptive. They've actually adapted to be carnivores and herbivores. Uh, sorry, car carnivores and insectivores, uh, which means that they will eat aquatic crustaceans, they will eat uh, terrestrial invertebrates, uh, they will eat snails and worms and frogs and newts, etc. So they are very, very adaptive and they can eat, the, the, it just means there is abundance of this vegetation throughout the year. So just going on to the physiology of the otter, and I mentioned before that it's a very large species. It's the largest riparian mammal that we have in the UK. And an adult male will weigh up to 17 kilos, which is an incredible weight. Um, its body length, its, its actual body part, its main body is up to 
almost a metre long. And then the tail can be actually as half, half that length again. Um, so you can see by the photograph just on the left hand side, just how long that tail is. And that really acts as a, as a rudder, as a way of actually propelling it through the water and really giving it, it, it its speed. The eyes protrude from the side of the head, which means that it's got a peripheral vision, which actually helps it in terms of uh, um, finding its prey. But actually the eyesight during the, in, in the day isn't actually that ideal. Where it does come into its own is, is at, um, at night when it's in water, or if the water is actually quite murky, and that's where the eyesight really helps with it being that peripheral vision. Um, the ears and the nose are actually quite small and they are able to actually close down because they have a type of valve within them that stops the water going in and again that, that allows the animal to actually stay underwater uh, for longer. And you can see by both the drawing and the photograph on the right hand side that the otter has these incredible whiskers um, that are part of their sensory system. And they use these in particular to hunt for their prey. So if they have um, a, a, a prey that uh, happens to uh, swim quite close by, they can quickly change direction and actually uh, you know, try and capture that prey quickly. Um, they also use it to navigate against other obstacles that might be in the water. So they are incredibly useful. Um, and the last, uh, almost a unique uh, type of uh, feature of this uh, otter is the webbed feet. Um, there's a small photograph uh, just by the drawing there on the uh, top right hand side showing those, those webbed uh, webbing between the toes and this again helps them to propel through the water and they can get up to quite fast speeds under that water. So although they are essentially a, a, a terrestrial species because obviously they breathe in air out of the water. They have adapted incredibly well to be super slick swimmers and to capture the prey in the water. So again, I'm just going to play you a video just showing you really just how how big these male otters are. Uh, this is one that's that's got out onto a reed raft and it's just uh, urinated on the reed raft just to show it's um, it j just to um, really you know claim its territory uh, and that big tail you know you can just see how big it is in relation to its its whole body so an incredibly large mammal um, that is relatively easy to um, to identify. So the otters, they're, they're actually uh, active all year round, as are the water bells and the water shrews. So none of our riparian mammals uh, hibernate, uh, but they are active at different times of the day or night. And the otter is largely nocturnal um, and it's mainly active at dusk. Having said that, uh, there are um, quite frequent indications these days that our otters have been seen on our watercourses during the day. And um, we've had records of them being seen by people traveling into work or going and doing their shopping, particularly around by the Market Harbour area and going in towards the city where you might pass over the canal and the river. Um, so increasingly they are being seen during the day. Um, they spend about four to six hours in the water out of that 24 hours. So they're not constantly in the water because when they are in the water, they are expending quite a lot of energy. So they tend to alternate between foraging and resting. And they tend to forage up to about four and a half to five kilometers every night. So a reasonable um, you know, length of water course that they're covering. The males are solitary. They will cover a total range of around about 15 to 20 kilometers. But throughout that range, they will divide it up into, say, those five kilometer sections. And with each of those sections, there could be a halt or there could be a lying up place where they feel safe and they can get out, out of water and they can lie up during the day and rest. The females similarly are solitary animals and they have a home range of around about seven kilometers. So an awful lot smaller 
that they will tolerate um, other females in their area, particularly when they're rearing cubs, which seems to be counterintuitive. But actually, because they're most vulnerable at that um, that stage when they're they're rearing their young, then that might be the reason why they're actually able to to tolerate each other. They're also not uh, sexually active during that time, and that might be another reason because there's no threat. The idea is is to increase their numbers and to make sure that their cubs have as best survival as possible. To um, to uh, designate their territory, they leave sprites um, quite frequently on areas that are protruding out of the water. And these might be man-made or natural obstacles in the water. So they might be big boulders, or they might be, say, at the confluence of streams and the river. They're, they tend to be sort of crossing points where a large a larger number of mammals might actually pass through those areas. Um, so under bridges, at the confluence of, of watercourses, um, bridge abutments, um, you know, it, it, and, and boulders and at the edges of weirs are probably most likely that you're going to see a sprint. And the sprint will be usually sort of quite a sticky clump of material um, where you can actually see the fish scales, you might see the fish bones with, within those sprints. And that's because of the large number of of fish that they have to eat every day. So again, it's quite a unique marking way and it's quite a unique uh, you know, sign to actually look for. Um, they sprint purely to uh, as a territorial uh, way of uh, marking their territory. So it's to ward off other males from coming into their territory. And if they're sexually active, it's also to let the male and the female know that they're around. And sometimes they do sprint on top of each other, uh, on top of each of the sprint uh, to let each other know that they are there for when they come back to those sprinting points. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a glass of, um, a quick drink of water. So with the water bowl, obviously a much smaller species, um, most of you will know uh, what a brown rat or a guinea pig looks like, and that's really the, the type of size of, of a water bowl. Um, you can see that uh, from the pictures, it's got a really sort of quite a nice glossy brownish coat. And in some cases, they have a black coat, um, particularly in the Scottish, area, in, in Scotland, in some of the Scottish Highland areas, they've developed this uh, genetic diversity uh, where uh, the black gene predominates. This outer pelage, it, pelage is very thick. It's, it's a waterproof coating. And under that, you, they have um, guard hairs, which are also quite thick. And this acts as an insulation layer for them so that when they're getting in and out of the water, they're not getting too cold and, yet, and, and, uh, and dying of hypothermia. They also have a hairy tail uh, which uh, makes them different from the, the brown rat, which has a hairless tail. And actually, even though the hairs on the tail are actually quite small, it does actually help them to, to swim. Uh, they have a blunt muzzle, so a blunt nose, similar to the other uh, bowls, such as the field bowl and the bank bowl. And they also have quite small black eyes, black beady eyes, um, which actually means that they, they are quite poorly sighted. Um, their ears, which are actually quite difficult to see, but if I can point them out with my cursor here, if people can see it, these are the ears on either side at the top of its head. And they tend to be quite rounded and close to the skull. And this again helps them with being quite streamlined um, for when they're in the water. Again, this is um, a, a difference between the water bowl and the rat, because the brown rat has uh, protruding ears that when the rats are in the water, you will see them quite upright out of the water and uh, their ears actually sticking up quite well. They have sharp 
claws, um, again, you can see this on the, the photograph here. Um, so these aren't particularly useful for when they're swimming, but they are very useful for digging out the burrows. And you can see one of the burrows behind uh, this particular water bowl here that's been dug out. Um, and they're very good for climbing up out of, onto the bank so that they don't slip back in. Um, and for holding their food as well, because they're actually quite dexterous. Um, so often the, the type of posture that you might see your water bowl in is just sitting like this one is, uh, actually looking quite cute, it has to be said, but, but sitting on its haunches um, with either a piece of food um, in its paws or just holding its paws, just in anticipation of something to happen. So again, the, the water bowl is active all year round. And you might see it during the day. So if you're walking along by the watercourse, if you see something uh, sort of scurrying around, you might recognise it as a water bowl. It's not as active in winter, and it will actually cohabit with other water bowls in its burrows over winter. And this might be a way of actually keeping warm. And it might also mean that a lot of our water bowls don't actually reach sexual maturity until the following spring and because they haven't reached that sexual maturity then they're not actually in competition with each other that, that much uh, which which could mean that they could cohabit uh, a little bit more when they avoid predation one of the things that they do is instead of actually going back off into the vegetation they tend to go into the water and they either do that through um, uh, directly through one of the tunnels that might be actually exiting out into the water or through just jumping off whatever they're, they're, uh, they're balanced on on the bank and they just throw themselves into the water. So even if you don't see the water bowl, then you might hear one of these plop sounds as they just fall into the water. Um, I mentioned before that they swim fairly close to the surface and often you might see them swimming parallel to the riverbank uh, rather than actually across, directly across uh, the current. Uh, again, it's about saving energy and, um, and, and uh, you know, need, needing to use that energy to feed on uh, rather than actually, you know, use too much up with, with, uh, with all the swimming that might carry them further downstream. Um, the male territory is actually quite large, it's up to about 300 metres, um, and it overlaps with several females. And those females, uh, that, what, that male water bowl might breed with. So it can be quite promiscuous um, in terms of actually trying to father as many offspring as it can. Um, the female territory is about half or a third of the male territory. Uh, so a maximum of about 150 metres, but the females will defend that territory quite fiercely. And that's because they need that habitat to actually breed, breed and to um, rear their young. So all the time there's that competition for the amount of food and the amount of space that they, they have to rear their young. And they mark their territories by uh, by these latrine piles. So again, in the in the bottom section here, we have a, a typical pile of droppings, and often they will uh, put droppings on top of other droppings so that they actually get quite flattened down um, when, when there are a lot of water bowls around um, as a way of actually saying, don't come beyond this point. Uh, this is this is my territory that you're going to enter. So again, we've got a little video here just to show you um, a really, what is really quite a nice little video of a waterfall feeding on a piece of grass. Um, the waterfall tends to, uh, you know, on its, on its haunches, chewing the, the grass, leaving it at around about a 45 degree angle. So if you see a pile of vegetation on the side of the bank, 
um, do have a look at it, pick it up and see what it looks like, because you might see that it is actually at that classic 45 degree angle. Um, and it tends to be sort of quite noticeable. You'll see in the background of this particular picture as well that there's a variety of vegetation there. In this case, it is typical aquatic or semi-aquatic vegetation, marginal vegetation. So it's quite soft uh, and quite lush and it, and it is a favoured uh, type of food of the waterfowl. So I'll just set that going again. So the water shrew in contrast is actually quite different. Um, again, quite small, similar size to a common shrew, uh, but only weighs up to 23 grams. And its body is only about 10 centimetres uh, long, but it has quite a long tail, an eight centimetre tail. So its tail is almost as long as its body. The classic feature of recognising the water shrew, not only is it associated with water, and our other shrews don't uh, generally swim in water, is the, the pelage. So it has uh, generally a black top and a white uh, undercoat, which is quite noticeable. Um, and the black pelage is, is very thick. And again, it has this sort of dense under uh, under layer of, of guard hairs to make um, the whole uh, outer coat quite waterproof and the inner coat uh, a way of insulating it against the cold. Some uh, water shrews are completely black. Um, so do, you know, do bear that in mind. If you see a type of shrew near the riverbank and, um, and it is completely black, it could equally just be a, a water shrew as well. Um, it does have very small ears. And again, if I can just show you where the ears are, you can see these tiny little white tufts on the side of the animal. And these are the ears and they're very close to the head. Um, the important physiological feature of the, um, the water shrew is that it has silvery hairs on its um, uh, on its uh, its on its tail, and again in the top corner here, we can see that um, the, uh, the, the the hair is actually quite closely. And I do have to thank Barbara Cooper, um, who submitted uh, both the the water true tail and the the photograph below to Nature Spot. Um, you know, with these close-up photographs, which really do show the nicely the physiology of this particular animal. The silver hairs um, on, the, on the tail actually act as a rudder. So they not only propel the animal through the water, but they actually help to steer it through the water as well. And the hairs on the paws are also uh, quite unique to this animal, and they also help it to swim faster. Um, you can see as well that it's got well-developed claws um, and these are, are, are for burrowing. So it does um, need those claws for, for that purpose. The other thing is that albeit a small animal, it actually is able to absorb a huge amount of oxygen for its size. And this means that it can hold its breath underwater for almost 20 seconds, which Considering that a otter can usually only hold its breath for about 30 seconds before it bobs back up, this is actually quite a, 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 um, a long time for such a small animal. So again, the water shrew is active uh, throughout the year. It doesn't hibernate. It's able to dive for its aquatic prey at any time of year. So even if it's really cold with uh, the, the ice um, and the snow around, as long as they can get access into that water, they will do that. They are mainly nocturnal, um, but they are active at dawn. So they've got a slightly different window in which they um, are active. And they also have territories. The males um, have a territory of about 160 metres, a linear uh, sort of territory uh, along the, the riverbanks. Um, but sometimes their daily movement might, uh, might actually be quite small, maybe 10 to 10 metres or so, uh, up to 60 metres. So sometimes they don't, they don't move very far at all. But what they do do is move that territory 
every few months or so. And I think this is related to the number of litters they have and the competition that there might be for food sources, um, for rearing their young and for creating burrows. And if they were to use the same burrow all the time, then they would be far more likely to be predated. Um, I've already mentioned that they stay active underwater for 20 seconds or so. Um, they create these, these wonderful burrow systems and they weave nests within those, those burrow, burrows and chambers to, uh, to rear their young. The other unique thing about them is that uh, their saliva is venomous and they're often able to catch prey that is quite a bit larger than themselves because they're able to bite the prey, which then stuns the, the prey, and then they're able to get uh, control of them and to, to, to take them to the bank and to eat them. So again, quite unique. Um, they also have the, the whiskers, uh, similar to the otter and the water bowl. Again, a sensory system, especially when they're underwater, and especially when it's dark or it's, it's dirty water, that they're able to use those two. Uh, to identify where their prey is. So again, if I can just activate the video, this will give you an idea of just how fast those shrews are. So you can see this in a bed of water crowfoot um, as it's slowly feeding and making its way to the far bank. Okay, so you can see how it how it swims almost across that the top of the water there uh, at a very fast pace. So within the uh, this particular slide, I've I've covered the breeding behaviour of all three species because I thought it was important to actually be able to compare one with the other more readily. Um, and each of them are slightly different, and each of them could be a cause for concern in terms of its future conservation. For the otter, um, it breeds throughout the year, uh, but its gestation period is actually uh, restricted, uh, similar to some of the other species. It only has one litter uh, per year, and that might be for, uh, it include two or three cubs. The cubs um, are completely dependent on the uh, mother, uh, in the first few weeks, similar to the water bowl uh, picture, uh, which shows the uh, here showing the the animal that is blind and naked. Um, so really, for the first ten weeks, the otter cub is completely dependent on the mother and doesn't come out of the hold uh, for for that length of time. The female will care for its young by itself, so the male is nowhere around. It will care for its young for approximately a year, which is quite a long time. And even into the 18 month period, the female might still be helping its young to feed and to forage and to, to learn how to catch fish. But the worrying thing about this is that although it might be 18 months before those cubs are free and independent and, and become sexually mature themselves, whilst that female is rearing its young, it's very unlikely that it's going to be able to meet another male readily and be, be able to breed. Um, and the lifespan of an otter in the wild is currently about four years, which is, is hardly anything at all, considering the amount of time it takes to, to actually rear a, a young cub and, and let it become independent. In captivity, the otters have been known to live up to 12 years. And a Eurasian otter has been recorded as living up to 22 years, but obviously that, that's a bit of an exception uh, to the rule. So the average is only four years. Um, the water bowl produces five litters um, a year. It, um, it produces them between April and October, and it usually produces around about six young. Um, per litter um, and they are ready to leave the nest after about a month after 28 days and if they're born after July then they have to reach a weight of 170 grams really to survive the winter and if they don't 
then they won't be strong enough. So for those uh, young that are born September October, and October, most of them are likely to die. Um, and for those overwintering, they won't actually become sexually mature until the following winter. And their lifespan is only um, generally five months. So that's not very long at all. And uh, at the most, they're living to about two and a half years. So again, a real cause for concern. The water shrew, on the other hand, produces two or three litters per year of up to 15 young, but on average, it's around about six, uh, six young. Again, they're born uh, blind and naked, and they, uh, they're completely dependent on the mother. But they, are, they do wean by 27 to 28 days, and then they stay with the mother for only another up to 40 days uh, before they're, they're independent uh, and sexually mature. So their lifespan, is 19 months. So three different species, three different types of reproductive me mechanisms. And um, I'm going to quickly just go on to their distribution. Um, in terms of the otter, then uh, the IUCN um, category is near threatened, but actually within the UK, it's clusters least concern. And that's partly because it's distribution is throughout the country. Um, the best estimate of that population is around about 11,000 um, with no upper or lower limit um, and it's felt that it successfully recolonized the UK but in a wider global sense it still clusters near threatened which means it's almost living on the edge, it's living on the threshold of whether it's going to survive or not globally. At a local level, uh, you only have to look at the two maps here and you can see there's a tremendous difference. Um, I've used two th the year 2000 as the marker in which to gauge uh, one year, uh, one uh, period to another. And before 2000, then we only had five records. And after 2000, we've got over a thousand. And obviously the distribution of that species post 2000 is incredible. And um, it's colonized uh, most of our major watercourses and also our minor watercourses. So really it has been a real success um, because it had nearly disappeared from many of our watercourses across the UK. And it was only with the reintroductions uh, that took place in the late 1980s and 1990s that this species has actually started to recolonize. And um, it wasn't actually reintroduced into Leicestershire itself. It was reintroduced into Derbyshire, uh, to Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire. So it's, it's you know, the, the records themselves speak volumes really in showing its success. The water well, on the other hand, is one of our most endangered species. And I think really and realistically, this is, type, this is the species that is likely to become extinct if we don't do anything about it. So the distribution records look like, you know, everything's okay. We've, we've, got, rec we've got records of water voles across, uh, you know, most of uh, the Northern Hemisphere. We've got them uh, distributed. Um, in large parts of the UK, apart from Devon and Cornwall and South Wales. And then as, as um, the, the map shows further north, it tends to be fairly patchily distributed. But actually the best estimate of the population size is only 132,000. And there could be as few as 99,000 um, or possibly as many as 329,000. Uh, with the research and the mark and recapture methods that have been used to estimate populations. But it is really a, a concern of uh, what is happening to our waterfowl populations. If we look at the local records, and if we were to just look at the two maps, then it, it, it could be quite misleading. Um, the number of records before 2000, 524 and after 2489. But actually we know from literature and we know from other areas of the country that the waterfowl suffered a huge decline 
uh, during the mid 1980s to the mid 1990s, uh, largely due to the mink predation. And uh, really, if we look at the, the records for after the year 2000, then although the number of records might be similar, the, the spread of, of those records is, is very different. So we've got quite a gap really going down through the centre of Leicestershire uh, along the Soar and the, uh, the catchment uh, centrally within Leicestershire where there's just no records um, and this is where the water bowls have largely disappeared and where the mink has moved in. The reason for the number of records uh, being so high might be that we've got a glut particularly say around by the Ashby Canal um, on the border with Northamptonshire. And also we've got a glut uh, probably around Rutland Water where there were, um, there, there was a, a reintroduction in around 2010. Um, and there's been monitoring every year since then. So there'll be duplicate records uh, within that location, obviously as that study continues. With the water shrew, this is the, this, this is the mammal that we're uh, least concerned about, uh, but largely don't know very much about. So the distribution records show that, yes, it's, it's uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's doing quite well. Um, it's doing well within the UK, apart from up in Scotland, where it's got Apache distribution. But actually, if we look at the numbers of water shrews, then it could be anything between 2000, uh, sorry, 237,000 and 1.9 million, which is a huge range, um, which I think it's just giving us an idea that really we don't know. We, if it was only 237,000, then we might be putting uh, a bit more of a focus on this animal. If we look locally at our distribution records, then again, it, it tells a very strange story because we've only got seven records before 2000. And I think that's largely because they were just unrecorded. Nobody really had an interest in them, maybe. Uh, nobody was worried about them, maybe took them for granted, uh, didn't know, uh, uh, you know much about them at all. Over the last few years, there's been more of a drive to, to get more records so that we, we are more aware of, of what the species distribution is uh, and their welfare across uh, Leicestershire and Rutland. And it, we've had a small increase, but certainly we, we, we want to better understand where these shrews are, uh, what types of habitats that they're doing well in, and to encourage people to, to uh, record them more because they're, they're by no means uh, an unknown quantity, so to speak. So bearing in mind the time, I'm just very quickly going to go through some of the threats. And I know that a lot of you will have heard a similar story with some of our mammals, other mammals and our other species. A lot of it is to do with habitat loss. And that might mean uh, because uh, of the infrastructure that has been lost. Uh, we've had concrete channels put in because of flood relief, uh, flood alleviation. Uh, we've had steel piling put in on the sides of uh, banks for flood control and to control erosion. Um, and all this is is fragmenting the habitats. It's it's stopping the animals moving from one area to another. It's it's meaning a loss of their uh, the plant matter and the vegetation that they might eat or where they can hide in. So this is having a, a huge effect in, in how one set of habitat is linked to another, particularly when you're talking about a watercourse that should be better connected. Um, likewise, in the wider environment where these small brooks or these uh, ditches are being dredged, um, Again, very open habitat is created. Uh, maybe burrows are damaged or destroyed. Vegetation is removed. And if animals are going to move along these watercourses, it's actually going to make them much more vulnerable because they're open. They're not able to actually hide within that vegetation. And so they're going to be much more liable to, to be predated upon. Agricultural practices, um, I'm certainly not here to point the, the finger at the farmers, uh, but there are still unfortunately practices where things are damaging our watercourses. Uh, banks are being uh, destroyed by cattle 
poaching too close to the uh, water's edge uh, and denuding areas of vegetation. Uh, we've got uh, land that is ploughed up to very close to the water's edge and actually causing banks to collapse um, and uh, creating an increase in organic matter that enters the water. Um, this causes poor water quality, um, it affects the, the types of uh, fish or aquatic invertebrates that might be within those watercourses and this will have a knock-on effect on the food chain and on those riparian mammals. So all in all, it might not be one incident that's affecting uh, the, the particular mammals, but if it's done regularly along our watercourses, this is really going to have an impact. Uh, plastics obviously hit the headlines a few years ago, and unfortunately, the situation is still there where we've got uh, floating debris, we've got plastics in the water, and we have plastics breaking down now into smaller chunks and into microplastics. And this is, this is all affecting our, our riparian mammals in particular. Uh, they might get caught up in the debris, uh, they might get tangled in it and not being able to escape, or they might start to eat it. Um, and this is, is obviously going to affect their, their digestive system and they won't be able to actually get it through their, their, uh, their bodies and, uh, and out. So it, it, it catches within their, their stomachs and eventually uh, causes them to starve. Um, the microplastics and also the, the actual pollution that might be coming out of our um, out of our discharge points can have a direct and an indirect effect on our mammals. It can affect them directly by affecting their their um, what what they're they're drinking or what they're absorbing through their skin. Um, so it can poison them that way, or it can affect them indirectly by the amount of food that they they may be eating. So the knock on effect of it affecting our fish will then affect. Uh, the otters, uh, the knock-on effect of affecting the aquatic invertebrates will affect the, uh, the, the water shrews. So it's both the indirect and the direct effects that, that could have a devastating effect on, on our mammals. Um, housing, employment land and road building are all what is needed across uh, our country with our growing population. But where it happens and how it happens is the important thing. And obviously that there's an example here where we've got a direct loss of, of fairly good quality habitat. Um, some high rise blocks of flats here have been built along the watercourse. Steel piling has been put in, uh, just denuding the area of natural vegetation, which is actually occurring on both sides. Unfortunately, the bank on this side has been retained. Um, but this, again, is going to have a direct effect on loss of habitat, but also an indirect effect when these uh, properties uh, are in use. Uh, lots of domestic pets, cats might uh, predate directly on water bowls and water shrews, uh, dogs might go into the watercourses and into the ponds uh, where those animals are and um, create uh, poorer water quality and disturbance. Um, so it's not only the immediate, but the longer term effect that we need to be aware of. Predation um, is, a, is a huge factor for the water bowl in particular. And this is where the American mink has really come into its own. The American mink has been so successful in predating on water bowls because the kits are able to, uh, which is a, the, the, the young term for the American mink, they're able to, uh, to get into the, uh, the burrows of the water bowls and then eat uh, and predate on the water bowls. And they will keep going back to an area. Uh, they keep getting taken back by their mother until uh, the, uh, the water bowls are no more and then they will move on to a different area. The unfortunate thing about the mink compared to the otter is that the mink is actually quite successful at reproduction. It uh, lives it out in the wild for 10 to 12 years compared to the water, uh, sorry, compared to the otter. And it will have um, only one litter a year, but it will have uh, a litter of about four to six young. And they will be independent by a year old. So it, they've got a quick 
uh, process and they live for much longer and they have more kits uh, to predate in the water bowl. So it's unlikely that even though the otter is a top predator, whether they can actually outcompete uh, the American mink successfully. Um, although there is evidence that the otter is displacing the mink from some of our major watercourses, and it might mean that that will allow the water bowls to come back to those areas. The water shrew does get predated by lots and lots of things, uh, not surprisingly. Um, so there's some examples here of, of the types of, of animals, uh, birds, uh, other mustelids that do um, predate on the water shrew. However, its carcass is, is or, or parts of its carcass are very rarely find, found. So and that's usually because um, the, this toxic saliva makes it unpleasant to eat. So although the predators might kill the water shrew, they very rarely actually eat it. Um, so they usually leave it on the side, and that's where, unfortunately, some of our records have, have come from for the water shrew. On top of all this, we have climate change. Uh, so we have our stream uh, temperatures, very hot or very cold, causing our animals to dehydrate or get hyper or hypothermia. And then we have our storm events like we've had over the last few weeks, where it's caused the water levels to rise. Some of our young get uh, flushed out uh, of their burrows. Uh, they're unable to swim against the currents and the, the fast flowing water. And some of the fields and the, and the banks um, are, are covered with water for a reasonable length of time. So that water, uh, so, so that uh, food source is, is not available, certainly for the, the water bowls. Um, Similarly, on the opposite scale, we might have an increased number of droughts and that will make the toxicity of the water worse. Um, so there's more likely to be uh, more severe pollution incidents. There might be lower oxygen levels in the water and that will start to affect the fish populations. So again, the, the effects of climate change are quite severe um, and it's something that we shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't forget about um, the, the very real uh, threats it has to these riparian mammals. So trying to finish on a, on a positive note, um, some of you might have heard of these nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches that allow more natural systems to be used to uh, try and find solutions that will be good for humans, but also bring about biodiversity benefits, for, particularly for, for our riparian mammals in this case. And one of the things is about protecting our areas. So if you've got important areas, you know, our Ramsar sites, our, our pristine watercourses, um, you know, it's important that we keep those, we look after them and we, we, uh, we conserve them and we, we avoid any, any further losses. If you've got particular problems with pollution or plastics, then it's issue specific and we actually identify our ways and means of how we can uh, we can we can reduce the impacts of those and eradicate those again with the infrastructure it's about planning where best to do our development and not just doing at it on an ad hoc or a piecemeal basis and how we manage our habitats is very very important so we manage them in the appropriate way and we manage them in the right way for particular species and we also restore areas. So if areas have had steel piling in the past, there's no reason why we shouldn't, apart from cost maybe, but there's a, you know, why can't we take some of that plastic piling out and replace it with more natural banks? So there's all these different ways that we can use to, to try and create a better environment uh, for our nature and for wildlife generally, uh, but particularly in this case for our riparian mammals. And that's the end of the talk. So I'd like to uh, finish off with that really. And obviously if there are any questions then I'd be delighted to, to try and answer them. Well, thank you, Helen, for an extremely informative and superbly presented talk. There are just a few questions and Pam might not, I think we'll ask them for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello there, Pam. 
Uh, Sue Brown wanted to know if the water shrew saliva is toxic to humans. Um, it is toxic to humans in terms that if you were bitten by a water shrew, you would get a sort of a, a nasty little rash. Um, so you would get a noticeable reaction to a water shrew bite, but you, you wouldn't be particularly ill from it. So you might have to put some cream on it, uh, a bit like an insect bite. It's unlikely to kill you unless you get an allergic reaction to it. Uh, but yeah, it just showed that even with such a small mammal, you would still actually get a reaction from it, considering the difference between our size and, and the size of the water shrew. Right, thank you. Uh, there's one from Pam, not me, I uh, want to know if you provide input into planning applications for development near water courses. Yes, I, I have. So in my role, uh, I've, I work for the Leicester City Council and I've actually been attached to the uh, planning department. Um, and part of that role as, as a nature conservation officer is to advise on appropriate development uh, to make sure that uh, areas are avoided if they can't be avoided, that there's appropriate mitigation in place. Um, and if, only as a last resort would we accept that compensation could be done somewhere else. So it's always about trying to avoid first and then to mitigate. And the mitigation might be about um, doing things in a certain way at a certain time of year to avoid impact on the riparian mammals or to um, translocate the mammals to, to a different place if necessary. Um, but obviously those, those practices are avoided wherever possible. And a question on my own behalf. Um, some years ago, our next door neighbor but one, um, who had a large koi uh, carp pond, mm. ha had all his carp eaten or well, partly eaten by otters and, and I gather this is not unusual it does this still occur it, it does uh, I'm afraid to say um I, I, uh, I mean at the end of the day the the otters are wild animals and they're opportunistic animals as well um so like many top predators Although they're very good killing machines, they will always go for the easiest prey. And particularly if they've got cubs to feed, they will be looking for a ready source. And if there's a, a carp pond to be had, um, then I'm afraid that they are likely to, to use it. Um, you know, it's the same that we have with, with carp lakes, you know, with, with the large carp lakes. And there's measures that, that you know, uh, we, I suppose it's advice, information, raising awareness about how uh, you know the two can can work together. But I think with private ponds, you know, and, and carp uh, fishing, uh, you know, ponds within uh, private gardens, it might be easier to protect them uh, from and, and stop otters actually getting into into the garden to uh, to get access to the fish than it is with with a um, with a fishing lake, perhaps. All right, thank you. Okay. I'll carry on, Pam. There are a number of questions come in on the chat, if you'd like to look. Oh. So why why is the otter's lifespan only four years? What is contributing to this? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the lifespan in the, in the wild is only four years. And I think that's largely because of the threats that I mentioned in the, in the presentation. It's, it is very vulnerable. Um, it's, it, it has quite a large territory, but within that territory, then it's going through towns and cities. It's having to go under, under or over roads. So um, if there's no otter crossing, say under a bridge, the only way that it might be able to get across to a different part of the watercourse, it might have to go up onto a road. And quite frequently, and I know you mentioned the badgers, uh, you know, suffering from road kills at this time of year, but increasingly we are getting reports of, of road kills of otters um, across the county, um, which to a certain extent, it just showed that there's more otters around because of that, but it, it is generally the number of threats that are still around for the otters to have to cope with. 
And there's a question from Bob, but it's one that occurred to me. He's querying why there are no water voles in Devon and Cornwall. I think that's largely due, just due to the, the predation. Um, the, the, the mink have had such a devastating effect and in some areas they've actually managed to eradicate them. Um, the otters are doing actually quite well in uh, Devon and Cornwall and they've got a beaver um, sort of reintroduction program which was actually one of the first areas of the country to reintroduce the beavers and the one good thing about the beavers is that they actually create ideal habitats for water bowls um, so the fact that they've been found absent for a number of years means that there could be opportunities for either reintroduction or natural colonization from surrounding counties. And, and several people are you know, concerned about the low uh, lifespan of otters and wondering why why this is and there's any what's contributing to it. Yeah, I mean, it it is largely to do, as I say, with those threats. It, it's to do with the 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 well. I've already mentioned the road kills, so some of them will be killed on the road. Um, the the actual way that they reproduce the actual um, dependence of their young uh, for 18 months or so just not being able to go out and, and breed and to create their own young it, it's a very uh, it, it's a, a K strategist as they say in, in, in ecology terms that they it, it takes them it, a long time to mature to become sexually active, to then reproduce. And because of that low process, then the turnover and the increase in numbers is actually, is actually quite slow. So when you have the effects of uh, climate change and cubs are, are washed out of their burrows and not being able to um, you know, swim against the currents uh, and get displaced, then it's having an increased effect because it's going to take maybe another 12 months before that female might be able to reproduce again. So all in all, they are, they are having this, this, you know, th this incredible effect on these animals. And someone else on this, again on the same subject is wondering about installing road reflectors, um, which has been done on Mull, which to stop the otters being killed on the roads. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think they, there's talk of doing that, particularly where they can show that there might be a, you know, an accident hotspot. I think the, the, the problem with um, doing that type of thing in, in a particular area is that, again, these are wild animals. They will choose where and when they want to cross the road. And unless it's a, um, a mechanism that can be put on most of our, our major uh, road networks, then I don't think it's actually going to have a, a significant effect on, on the otter populations. I think uh, when you've got that type of mechanism in a, in a small geographic area, such as the Isle of Mull, then it would have um, an effect, and a, you know, a very positive effect. But it, it's quite difficult with the infrastructure and the road networks that we've got um, across uh, the UK. Yes, I can understand that. There's someone yeah. uh, saying that otters are not uncommon in, in during daylight in their local country park and the torrent of dogs and people. Is this uncommon? I, it, no, it's, it's not uncommon. So in the past, um, I guess when people weren't as aware of otters uh, because we didn't have very many in the country, then they were seen largely as a nocturnal species. And I think to avoid predation, they probably were largely nocturnal. But increasingly, we are getting reports of the otters quite openly swimming, you know, bobbing around, um, you know, adults and, and youngsters. Uh, and, and I mentioned Market Harbour being a classic place that apparently if you go to Sainsbury, Sainsbury's, park the car, nip along to the watercourse, you know, quite frequently, um, you know, certainly in the last few years, you could see the, the otters swimming about in the water. Um, so I think this is, I think the, the behaviour possibly of the otter is changing. And because humans aren't seen as, as 
predating on them openly, then they feel more comfortable coming out into the into the open during the day. So I think increasingly we will see more otters out during the day. And as the numbers hopefully continue to rise, they will they will feed at different times. So it's almost like creating their own niches where some otters might be out during the night, some might be out during the day. Well, thank um, you. I think we're in with one last question, which I've picked up. And uh, are the road mortality otters sent off to Cardiff University for post-mortem? I know a lot of road kill go there. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, certainly all the ones that, well, I say all the ones. I, unfortunately, I've only picked up two in the last five years or so. Um, but yeah, we do send them off to, to Cardiff and we, we've got a very good uh, relationship with them. They send us back the uh, the analysis, the post-mortem analysis, and I think it's important that they continue to get that funding to um, to uh, develop our understanding of, of otters generally. Um, I think, I do believe it's different in different parts of the country, but certainly the relationship we have with Cardiff and the Environment Agency is very good um, in the East Midlands and long may it continue. Thank you, Helen. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. You're getting lots of thanks and grateful thanks. That's great. Thank you very much. Through, yeah. which is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to make a correction on my announcements at the beginning. I said the 14th is the date of the debate in Parliament to, to talk about Badger Cull shooting. It's actually the 21st, so you've got a bit more time. So please look at the Badger Tusk website. So I'm going to pass this back to our host, Jordan, but thank you very much to Helen, to Pam thank you. for it's assisting, been great. and also, well, and thank you to Jordan, and also thank you to everyone who's attended tonight. It's been a great evening. Over to you, Jordan. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Helen. Um, uh, for everyone interested, this talk is recorded, so if you would like to share it with your family or friends, it will be available on YouTube within the next couple of days. And if any more questions do come in, uh, please just email them to info at LRWT and we can pass them on uh, to David or Helen. Um, any information about the Leicestershire and Rutland Badger Group, um, we can share that with you as well. Um, I'd just like to mention as well that if, if there is any um, Osprey fans, it is World Osprey Week. Um, started on the 21st of March and we're having a week full of activities so um, all of the follow-up uh, emails I'll send you the link for that because we are doing a sign up for family activity sheets and we also have an Osprey 25th anniversary appeal and um, so we are um, asking for any donations to support the Rutland Osprey project there. So that's all from me this evening thank you again to Helen and thank you to the Rutland um, Badger Group, let's share Rutland Badger Group and we'll see you all in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.